Howdy. How's everybody doing? Yeah, you're surviving from last night, whatever your last night was? Wow, this is a good, I mean, 9 o'clock in the morning, I thought, oh, yeah. no, they've given me the slot 9 o'clock after the big party night. Yeah. Holy moly, if, if I have somebody show up, I'll be thankful. So uh, I'm extremely thankful <laughs> for seeing all of you here today, so thank you. My name is John Kindervog. I am the field CTO uh, for Palo Alto Networks, and I'm the person who created Zero Trust. So I'm going to be talking to you about implementing best practices for Zero Trust, a platform approach. And I'm going to be doing it with my good buddy Hans Q. <laughs> he is uh, a Wonderful. famous rapper from the middle of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> of the Netherlands, also an IT guy over at, uh, at Damon Shipyards. In fact, he's the CISO. So he's got a big job over there. And he's going to be talking about how he did what, uh, we, had, uh, what, what we created in Zero Trust years ago. So, you guys ready to learn a little bit more and talk some more? And hopefully we'll have some time for <laughs> questions. So we're going to be talking about zero trust and why do you do zero trust? Well, the main reason you try to do zero trust is because this gives you a security strategy that you can take up to the highest levels of your executive teams, not just your CISOs, but your CEOs and your board of directors and your VPs of finance. I myself have given versions of this speech to CEOs and boards of directors around the world. And so if we look at the grand strategy of cybersecurity, we can see that it must be to stop data breaches. Data breaches are the thing that gets executives in trouble. So what is the one thing that can get the CEO fired that you can do in IT? You can allow a data breach. And that's what happened to TalkTalk Talk in England. I don't know if you've heard of TalkTalk. Talk. Anybody in England, from England here? I know we got one up there. And so when I, the first time I went to England, right after this, they said, oh, whatever you do, don't have a Dido moment. And I'm like, Dido? She dropped an al another album, right? And they go, no, no, not that Dido, the other Dido. And I'm like, there's two Didos in the world? Who knew? Right? And there was Dido, the singer, who was the one I know about, and then Dido Herring, uh, the, the poster child of saying the exact wrong things when there's a data breach. If you, if you ever go on YouTube and watch all of her videos, it was essentially like, it's your fault that you got breached. Ha. Huh? Don't, you know, don't come back to us. And so she eventually lost her job because of a data breach. So ultimately, zero trust is a cybersecurity strategy designed to keep your boss's boss's boss employed. If we get down to it, that's what we're trying to do because we're trying to stop data breaches. Now, if we go on to uh, what it actually means, right, it confuses a lot of people because you've all, all heard that you're trying to make a system trusted and all that kind of stuff. And that's not true, right? Anybody who tells you the goal of zero trust is... Uh, to make a system trusted uh, absolutely is a poser. They do not understand what zero trust is. In zero trust, we're trying to eliminate trust from digital systems because what is trust? Trust is a human emotion that we have injected into digital systems for absolutely no reason at all. No one knows how it got there. Just yesterday, they announced that there's the, these new hacks on TPM modules uh, in CPUs, right? So the trusted performance module, oh, it wasn't so trusted after all. And so it's, a, it's what's known as a plastic word that we throw around for no reason at all. So it, tr it turns out trust, this human emotion that we've injected into digital systems for no reason at all, is the foundational problem in all of cybersecurity. Because trust is a vulnerability. You must understand this. Trust is a vulnerability. It is something that people are going to do bad things for. So what do you do with vulnerabilities? You know, you mitigate them, right? Absolutely. You have you got to get rid of those darn vulnerabilities, and this is the worst one. And the reason it's the worst one is because it's the only vulnerability in the world that is also its own exploit at the same time. What do you have to do to exploit trust? Do you have to create a new tool? Do you have to have a new script inside a Metasploit? Do you have to create some zero-day malware? Absolutely not. All you have to do is get on the network. And as a former penetration tester, we always got on your network. So it turns out the only entity on your network today who gets value from trust are the malicious actors who are going to exploit it. That should be scary to you. So if we look at the old trust model, uh, there was an untrusted side of the internet. That's the evil internet, because all bad things come from the internet. We all know that, right? And then the the trusted side went to the internal network. And that's where all your wonderful people work, 
right? I mean, they came to work on rainbow unicorns and giving out candy to little sure. boys and girls today, didn't they? Yeah, definitely. They're, they're so yeah. wonderful. And, 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 but, oh, no, what happens, right? Sometimes a bad thing can come from the evil Internet and get on the trusted side of the network. And so we, we all freak out. Some malware, some ransomware, whatever it is. Well, what is that stuff? It's a collection of packets. What are packets? Packets are zeros and ones as represented by electrons and photons. So in order for me, Hans, to exploit trust in your network, I just have to get a photon over on your internal piece yep. of fiber optic cable. Yeah, it's that would. simple, yeah. right? So we need to get rid of it because not only can I do that from the outside, on the inside we have things like uh, these malicious actors. Here's a couple of names that should resonate everywhere in the world. Snowden and Manning. You've heard about these. These people were trusted users on trusted devices. They had the right patch level, the right antivirus, passed all the NAC checks. But guess what? No one looked at their packets, the packets being generated by those devices when they were on the network. No one cared because you're trusted, so go wherever the heck you want. I was talking to uh, a, a person in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago who was instrumental in bringing down Manning after the attack, and his first thing that he thought, he told me, he said, the first thing I thought when I heard about this is, how does a private first class at a forward operating base in Iraq have access to classified State Department cables? Uh, uh, how does that even happen? That just is insane. And the answer is the trust model. Because once you're on that network, it was called Cipernet, but once you're on Cipernet, you get access to everything on Cipernet. And that's true in your environment, too. Once you authenticate into a network, then you get access to everything on the network. This is why the people who tell you that MFA equals zero trust are lying to you. If that were true, neither Snowden nor Manning could have happened because they have better MFA than you can ever afford. So we have to get rid of trust. No more trusted systems, no more trusted packets, no more trusted interfaces, no more trusted users, no more trusted devices. Now people will say to me, John, you are saying that people are untrustworthy. And I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying something much, much more profound. I'm saying people are not packets. No person has ever been on a network. It is the anthropomorphization of the network that's killing us. The idea that John is on the network, that Hans Q is on the network. I don't know about you, Hans, but I have never been on a network. I have never shrunken down into a subatomic particle where I've been transferred via RF signal to a wireless access point and turned, in, turned from 802.11 protocol to 802.3 protocol so I could surf the public internet. That has never happened to me. It rarely even happens in the movies. It's happened in Tron, Lawnmower yeah. Man, yeah. but even in the even Matrix, in the they got to plug in, right? So this isn't about people. Zero Trust does not care about people. It cares about packets. What are packets doing? What resources are they accessing? Are, should they be accessing them? How do we have pa uh, policies that prevent them from accessing the wrong things and enable them to access the right things? So there's four basic Zero Trust design concepts. Zero Trust is super easy. Everybody else is saying it's really complicated. It's not. Downstairs, you can get a pack of Zero Trust playing cards. And then you can go on the internet and watch me show you how to design a network with a deck of playing cards. It's that simple. People who say it's complicated, they don't know anything about it. They're lying to you. So these four design concepts are this. Focus on the business outcomes. What is the business trying to achieve? Do you normally ask that? Probably not. In fact, business leaders tell me that when they, when they think about IT and IT security, they think of them, those guys are the department of no. They just tell me no all the time, right? So we got to say, we're the department of yes. You want to do something? Yes, let, let me help you do it securely in a zero trust fashion. And then we design the network from the inside out instead of the outside in. You know, I, I'm a recovering network engineer from the old days. Uh, I have a lot of certifications from that company, uh, Voldemort, right? The name that shall not be named. Uh, and we learned to design networks from the outside in. You started at the edge, right? The CPE equipment. Absolutely. You moved into the router. You really cared about that. And the, then the core switch and the distribution layer switches, the access layer switches. And then you said to the business, plug your stuff in wherever you want to. And now GDPR said, hey, where's all your stuff? And we go, we don't know. Not an idea. 
No, no idea. idea at all. Right? Because we designed it in the wrong way. So in zero trust, we start at the data or assets we're protecting. And then we determine who or what needs to have access, need to know, least privilege, right? So neither Snowden nor Manning needed to have access to most of the data they stole in order to get their job done. This is the MFA part, right, and identity part. But you can't just do it at identity alone. You have to inspect and log all the traffic all the way up at layer seven. You can't stop at layer three. Okay? Some people say, I'm doing zero trust at layer three. No, you're not. Every single attacker knows how to bypass a layer three security control. And then they'll say to me, oh, no, we have a layer four firewall. No, you don't. There is no such thing as a layer four firewall. Layer four is metadata about layer three. Hey, I forgot what port 53 is. Uh, let me look in the firewall rules. Oh, yeah, DNS, right? Port 21, what is that? That's uh, F F FTP, is that what it is, right? Port 22 is SSH. You know why port 22 is SSH? Because the guy from Finland wrote a letter and said, hey, I got a protocol that's kind of halfway between FTP and Telnet. Can you give me port 22? They said, sure. It's all arbitrary. There's only one port number in the whole thing that makes sense, and that's the port number for Doom. Only one video game has a signed port number. It's Doom, and it's 666. At least that one makes sense, right? <laughs> so we inspect and log all that traffic for la through layer 7, and we do that in policy and PAN operating system. That's why I decided to join Palo Alto Networks. So the best way I can show you is to give you a visual example of how the US Secret Service protects the President of the United States. This is President Obama's 2009 inauguration parade. And you can see here that the, the Secret Service knows three things about the President of the United States that we don't know about the data or the assets we're supposed to protect. They know who the President is. They don't say, hey, we need to form a committee to do a presidential discovery project. They don't say, hey, uh, can you get us a tool, Hans, so we can scan for the President? We don't know where he is. We don't know who he is. And then they know where the president is at all times. They never go, hey, Hans, have you seen the president? No, Aren't today. we supposed to be no. protecting him? Right, we got guns and everything. We, we need to protect the president. And then they know who should have access to the president at, anyone, at, at any single time. They're very specific on that. I've been around a presidential detail. And so you can see here, January 2009, they had a, a perimeter, but uh, Look at the guys up in the upper right-hand corner. They got their hands in their pockets. Why? Because it's cold outside. Given the proximity to the beast where the president is, you'd think they'd be down in their ninja poses, right? Ready to Bruce Lee these guys. But no, they're just sitting up there. They're security theater. They're knocking down the low-hanging fruit. They're intimidating. That's not where the real security is coming from. The real security is coming down here at the protect surface. That's a fundamental concept in how you deploy zero trust. You understand what you need to protect. I can take the overall attack surface, shrink it down orders of magnitude into something that's knowable. That's called a protect surface. On this day, the protect surface is the president, his wife, and his two children. If they survive the day, it's a win for the Secret Service. No one else matters. And that should be true in your environment. The stuff you need to protect, if it gets protected that day, yay, that's a win. And so then they do something really amazing. They move their controls right up next to the protect surface. You know, in cybersecurity, if, we, if they did it the way we do cybersecurity, the guys on the left there, they'd be on the border of Mexico, and the guys on the right would be on the border of Canada. We, because we put all of our controls as far away as we possibly can from the things we're trying to protect, don't we? Our endpoint security is a long ways away from the protect surface of the data or resource that laptop is accessing. Our perimeter security is all long way away from the protect surface. In fact, it's so far away, we create a separate attack surface for the attacker. It's called our <coughs> internal network. Our internal network becomes a secondary attack surface for the attacker. So once they do that, then they can create uh, a micro perimeter in layer 7 policy. Notice those un uh, the plainclothes secret service agents. They don't have uh, gloves. They don't have their coats buttoned. Why? I mean, come on, maybe it's warmer down there than it is up where the other guys are. Do you think so? Do you think on that day it was warmer and they didn't need as much bundling up? No. It's because they got layer 7 controls underneath their coat. So they've defined a policy. On that policy, on that micro perimeter, says those two people in the front uh, row of the vehicle, 
can leave the microperimeter whenever they want to or whenever they're told to. But nobody can traverse inside the microperimeter because you're going to get layer 7 policy enforcement from those, uh, from those plain coast secret service if you do. And then they continue and monitor this in, and update it in real time. That's what the guys with the earpieces and talking into their, their uh, wrists are doing so that they can deploy new policy updates in real time. This is a zero trust model of uh, executive protection and it is the best visual demonstration of what zero trust is, should be done. So I build zero trust networks using Palo Alto networks and our, our partner technologies, and I do it with a five-step model. We first define the protect surface. What do we need to protect? Those are known as DAS elements, data, applications, assets, and services. You take a single DAS element, you put it in a single uh, protect surface. And then you map the transaction flows. How does the system work together? This tells you how to architect the zero trust environment. You then create policy and then you monitor and maintain it. These five steps, you do it over and over again for each different individual protect surface. Now, I want to turn it over to, uh, to uh, Hans Q from Damon, and he's going to talk about how he used this five-step model to deploy uh, zero trust inside of Damon shipyards. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, before I start with our presentation, uh, I'd like to give you also a little bit of insight of what Damon is. We're a shipbuilding company. Um, we're active in roughly 40 different countries. Uh, we do approximately 200 vessels a year, and we have been partnering with our friends from Ontuit, uh, who've been actually helping us for the last uh, 11 years, uh, and to guide us and to groom us to a certain extent also on the principle of zero trust. So I was asked to, uh, to tell you a little bit about that, but when you start with zero trust, one thing is, of course, uh, very important. What are your crown jewels as an organization? Um, and in our case, you can imagine that if you build stuff like this, which is uh, something we recently launched, which is for the very rich and famous, if you want to do a polar expedition, come to me. I'll set you up with something like this. You can be autonomous for a month uh, with your own dive chamber, uh, submarines, everything you want. We put it in there. We also do this. Um, and this is where we started. We started with a simple tugboats somewhere in 1969. Uh, and we were building those, but we ventured into naval defense sector. We're also doing luxury yachts. And if you really, if you buy one of those, you have to get the next one as well because they're pretty much a package deal. And this is what we call the fast yacht support. This is where you keep your toys. So you can imagine that all the information we have is stored both in our ERP and in our PDM solution. Um, that's where we keep everything. That's where we pretty much align all our companies. So looking at what our crown jewels are, that's pretty much everything which is what we call in IFS. IFS is the tool we use within our company. Oh, by and the way, anybody who wants to buy some, just there'll be a line at, over here. He's got a credit card machine, so yeah. he'll be taking orders right after. Yeah, the, you the, might the, want to check with your account whether or not it's maxed out. but. We can even work on down payments, <laughs> it's true. Um, so looking at what IRVS was, we knew at least what we had to map, where we had to look at. And we were also at that time in a, um, actually in a lucky situation. Um, the lucky situation was that prior to, uh, to actually starting with this, our company used to be nothing more than a combination of companies who just shared the same name. They were always in the name, there was something like Damen in there. But that was prior to having our own production facilities, our own design facilities. There was strictly sales. We would outsource everything. But eventually we realized that we needed our own production facilities. Um, and we also decided to need our own engineering. So the entire value chain of our organization was connected there. So we started mapping, but also we started reorganizing the organization. Um, so we ended up actually setting up a completely new environment for our uh, ERP solution uh, in order to facilitate all our companies across the globe. And we, from the get-go, we decided to do that based upon Zero Trust. Since they had been brainwashing me already for a few years, uh, we, I think we started way back with uh, another solution, uh, not from Palo Alto, with IBM at that time. 
and eventually we moved there. So we started mapping and we started also to realize that um, we had to do it strategically different. So everything was going to change there. Um, and luckily the board was actually, um, as in many, let's say, uh, organizations like mine, uh, the board was uh, 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 very strict. We don't have a clue of what you're doing, but it appears you're doing it right and we're going to trust you and just get it done. Um, it's often quite easy set, but it's not also the reality. But we managed to get there. And then we started to, uh, to actually to think about how we're actually going to build the, uh, uh, the organization. Um, and you can imagine that here we also partnered with uh, external advisories because we very early on realized that for our own organization, um, that actually defining a new network or defining a complete new structure, you need outside eyes. Uh, first of all, it's a fresh insight at that time. And you also have to realize that many of your own staff, many of them really don't want to change. <laughs> and that's the biggest thing there is. A network engineer, or whether or not you can actually uh, remove the word uh, network, any kind of engineer, and you can imagine that being a, a shipbuilding company, we tend to have a lot of those. They are absolutely, they will grow a rash, they will throw, every, <laughs> everything will happen um, if you want to change everything. Depending on whether or not it's the smallest comma uh, or whatsoever. Um, luckily, we don't have the, uh, the TAPS versus uh, spaces discussion internally. Um, but you can imagine that as a very traditional organization, shipbuilding is a process which has been going on for hundreds of years. Um, it's, um, it's always stated that innovation in the sector was more like disaster driven. Something goes wrong, oh crap, the ship just sank. We have to do something else. So very traditional organization, um, not very digital. So that, that's definitely a challenge. That was the biggest challenge we, uh, we had. We started to, uh, uh, to design and I'm not, it doesn't really matter what it says here. Uh, but the idea is, of course, that what you do with Zero Trust, that you try to, to minimize your attack surface. You try to minimize as much as possible. So this is pretty much, and I'm actually going through this at a, at a quick pace, because the idea here was that we basically redesigned everything. Uh, we opened up two new data centers, and from that moment on, we put our crown jewels there. We put all the other stuff in the periphery there. Uh, Everything was still segmented, of course. Everything was uh, disconnected. And only when you had the proper rights, you could access the information. Uh, that was the design. And then, of course, then would be the next step. Then we actually start building or we start architecting it. And, and once you've architected it, you get to step four, which is creating yeah. policy. So if you've seen the movie Imitation Game about breaking the Nazi Enigma codes, in that movie, the character of Alan Turing says something really profound. He said, what if only a machine can defeat another machine? And that's true. We are living in an age where our adversary is highly automated. They are more automated than we are. They have some advantages that we don't have. One of them is they don't have change control. Think about that. Hey, I just tried to hack uh, Damon's shipyards. Uh, it didn't work, so when's my next hacking window? Oh, Sunday at 3 AM? Sure. Doesn't work like that, right? So now we have to become as automated and as agile as our attackers. And so we are building a machine to defeat a machine. You heard about it a lot yesterday. Uh, but for you, it, the policy is set up on the front end with Panorama. So if you've used Panorama, you know it's an easy policy management tool. All of our policy management tools are designed to be easy. Uh, our former CEO, now Vice Chairman Mark McLaughlin said, you have to create a management tool easy enough for me to create policy. That was the, the, de the metric. And so we can create this policy. It's known as a Kipling method policy. Kipling method policies uh, are very simple to understand. I can teach anybody how to use it. But it comes from the writer Rudyard Kipling, who gave us who, what, when, where, why, and how in a poem in 1902. So we have user ID to create a layer 7 replacement for source IP that defines a who statement. Who is accessing a resource? Then we have app ID to replace port and protocol that defines a layer 7 version of a what statement. By what application is that resource being a, uh, accessed? 
And so we have uh, well over 3,100 predefined application IDs, and we can create an application ID custom for you for any of your applications that we don't have in our database. And then we have, finally, content ID. That defines a house statement. By what criteria should that be allowed? Should we uh, make sure that threat protection or IPS happens? Should we make sure that all the attachments go through wildfire? So we have these very simple rules. You can see a couple examples, whether it's going to the cloud or on-premise. Everybody can understand that. I can teach uh, executives. I taught the CFO of a major uh, a financial company, how to create his own Kipling method policy. Said, what do you want to protect? I want to protect the finance app, so let's put that in the what column. I said, who do you want to have access to that? He said, I want the, me, the CFO, the VP of, of finance, and I want everybody who's in the finance department. Oh, that's simple because we know the OUs of those, and then we added multi-factor authentication to it, and then we, I said, well, you probably want to turn on some threat protection, and you want to make sure every attachment is uh, going through wildfire. He said, that sounds good. And so out of that, what was uh, literally dozens of rules for that application got down to three rules. Three rules. Very simple. He understood how to do it. We, we gave it to the engineer. The engineer immediately put that into an app. Ba uh, the application became the protect surface. Remember, it's one of the DAS elements, so that was the DAS element. And immediately it was turned into a zero trust policy. And so uh, then we could then use multi-factor authentication to consume that identity information inside user ID. Again, to reiterate, multi-factor authentication is not equal to zero trust. That is a lie coming from somebody who doesn't understand zero trust. We consume it as an attribute within user ID. User ID is a much more powerful identity tool than multi-factor authentication because it is much more granular, includes lots of variables inside there. So if you aren't using user ID, man, you want to. User ID and app ID and content ID are still the three most transformative core technologies ever in the history of cybersecurity. And then we could automate this using, um, using Policy Optimizer, where we look at the traffic, we look at the configurations that you have, and we automatically turn those uh, Layer 3 rules into App ID-based rules automatically. It's really cool. This is part of building the machine to defeat the machine. Now, Hans, you didn't have this. No, I wish we had at that time. Would have made our life a hell of a lot easier. It would have, but we've been listening to our customers. And so with 9.0 release, this came out in 9.0 Panorama. And you do not have to upgrade your 8.0 Panoramas, or 8.0 uh, uh, Pan OS devices to 9.0 to take advantage of this. You just need a 9.0 Panorama. So this is a great first step. You can automatically take those applications, which are DAS elements, and start putting them in zero trust environments. Now, you did this and started create policy and yeah. did your stuff for, right? Yeah. Um, absolutely. When we created this, um, we also, um, we pretty much, we, we, we realized that um, despite the fact that I mentioned earlier on that we would put our crown jewels in uh, a good, safe new spot, a brand spanking new data center, actually two data centers, um, we also uh, realized that we actually we had a bunch of, and probably the most dreaded word in the IT sector, legacy. Um, a legacy would be an absolute derelict of an application uh, uh, almost running on MS-DOS for, for one very strange reason. Could be that it's actually the machine it operates uh, refuses to work with anything else. Uh, you have utter shite in your uh, environment. <laughs> um, so you can imagine. Is that a Dutch word? No, I actually, I think I kind of forked it. Uh, oh, there. okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that you have um, stuff in your network where sometimes you have what uh, we actually used to call internally, you have the oh crap uh, or the beep protocol in place for that. You lock up everything and you realize something is going to break. You just don't know where, and you just don't know when. Um, and that is something which we were prepared for, which we were willing to take the risk of. And if you don't do that, that's going to bite you eventually. But you know in a large-scale organization, uh, if you look at our environment, if you look at where we are, we are in rural China, we are in Vietnam, we are in Europe, we're pretty much everywhere, uh, but also in low-wage oh, countries. Bless you. Just 
it's a constant gift. Yes. It's a constant gift. Yeah. Um, especially being the CISO. Yeah. That's absolutely uh, best job ever. Um, <laughs> but you can imagine that, uh, especially that you have to be harsh. You have to, at the moment, just say, well, guys, it's going to be like this. We're going to break stuff. And we're going to fix it. We're going to make certain that if it breaks, we're going to react as quickly as we humanly can in order to mitigate it. But that's the only way to get to a safe situation. Unless you're a greenfield. If you're a completely new organization, then you can do it from the get-go. I try to actually constantly, um, I'm both the CISO and actually have a double role. I'm responsible for uh, enterprise architecture. I'm responsible for a whole team of architects and organization. And the reason I'm both is, <coughs> that we very clearly made the decision to integrate both architecture and security. Because many organizations, you will quite often see that security is like a bolt-on thing. We actually, oh, the Department of No, I've heard it before. I've yeah. heard it uh, yesterday, I think, in the keynote as well. Um, and quite often, that's true. And if you actually try to train all your architects, the guys who come up with the new stuff, and have them do it safe by design, have them make it secure by design. And also, given the fact that we are a Dutch company, we also have to take uh, uh, legislation into place, GDPR. Uh, you have to also do it privacy by design, pri privacy by design. So you really almost have to say, guys, we are going to shut stuff down, we are going to kill it, and we're going to slowly open it up. Um, and you might encounter that. Uh, but that's the only way if you really want to make your organization safer, if you want to protect your, the proverbial crown jewels. Um, so when we've done that, this is a, um, nothing more than basically uh, uh, some of the rules we had. I really wish, at least on the behalf of my team, that we actually had the policy optimizer at that time. We, want to, we were doing this, I think this was 2014. So we've been doing zero trust since the very early on, uh, beginning. We're actually, uh, in the near future, we're going to have to redo it again because I mentioned IFS and I mentioned our PDM solution. And the fun thing is next year we're going uh, to a different solution. So we get to start all over again to a certain extent. Uh, oh, do you uh, need a hug? No, I probably need a beer. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I'm guessing more than one. <laughs> so, um, and then we came to actually uh, the last of the five steps in order to implement Zero Trust. And it was monitor and maintain. Or as I like to call it, uh, chuck it over the fence. Because that's one of the best things uh, in my book. Uh, having partnered with a security uh, partner who has been with us for a very long time, who has uh, actually uh, taught us um, how, to, uh, how to improve, how to get more mature, and also how I could utilize my very scarce, scarce resources. Because we are a shipbuilding company, which means we're not a SESI, we're not an IT company. I can't pay uh, the same, or I can't even get the same staff because who would likes to work with a shipping company if you're IT? Really? You want to work with Google, you want to work with Palo Alto, you definitely don't want to work with a, uh, a boring company who builds boats. Okay, utterly sexy boats, if I might say so myself, but still, we just build boats. So, we have limited people. So we need our partners for that. So without them, mission impossible. Absolutely mission impossible. So that's where Ontowit stepped in at that time. Um, and they still stepped in. And they, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's very good to see uh, where we've become, what we have become, what they have become. So for that, that's very good. Um, uh, yeah, and just Ontowit has a booth downstairs, so go take yeah. a look at that. Uh, I've, I've been working with them for, I think, a decade or so. I don't know, a long time. But uh, they've deployed more zero trust than anybody else in the world. So if you really want to get a real expert in this region to help you deploy it and manage it and maintain it, they have an app for Cortex Hub uh, downstairs. So go down to the booth, take a look at onto its booth. So let's talk about how you do this, right? I mean, where do you start? That's your question to me. And so I developed a thing called the a Zero Trust Learning Curve. It's based upon two different axes, the sensitivity or criticality of the protect surface. And don't ask me with, whether this is the X axis or the Y axis. I always get those things confused. But it's just the one that goes up and down, that one. Why? Is that why? I always ask Lee Wuyang, because he's better at the maths than I am. And then we have the time on the Zero Trust journey. Those are the two things that are critical that we're looking at. So early on, we're going to define this 
bell curve based upon a protect surface. Remember, we're doing this on a per protect surface basis. One protect surface contains one DAS element. If you understand that, you start to understand the simplicity and the real genius behind how you can deploy it. So the first ones that you do are learning protect surfaces. You learn how to do it. Folks, it's in low sensitivity stuff. The reason you're doing it in learning protect surfaces is because if you screw up, you get to start over again and nobody cares. Too many people started at the crown jewels and they made a mistake and said, we're never doing zero trust again. And I, that's what I would hear all the time. And I used to believe and advocate, start with the crown jewels. And then I found out, you don't know where your crown jewels are. You don't know how they work. So there's no way we're going to get to protect them. So we don't start there. We start with things what we call learning protect surfaces. The stuff inside there doesn't matter. The only reason to do it there is so that you can do it in a low risk environment. And then the second thing we do is we do the practice protect surfaces. You get to zero trust the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. Once you practice enough, that will give your people confidence that they can do this, and then they can do the crown jewels. And once you've got the crown jewels, the high value assets, whatever term you want to call it in your organization, you can start focusing on the secondary uh, protect surfaces, the things that, you know, over time, less and less sensitive. And the tertiary ones, the, 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 yeah, okay, we'll do them because we can. I'm, I'm teaching you how to build Lego blocks, right? So you're just taking and doing a new Lego block. I was, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I went to uh, Bjerinborg, uh, um, Denmark, which is the front row here. That's Bjerinborg, right? And, but I had to land in Billen, Denmark, which is the home of Legoland. And I've always used Legos as an example, right? So each, think of a protect surface as a Lego block. And you're just going to build the Death Star, or whatever you want to build with your Lego blocks. And then you'll get to where there's things that should never be in a zero trust environment because they're not important enough. So takeaways from Hans. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our main takeaways is actually that, well, I've listed them here, but the, um, the idea still is trust nothing. Make certain that you do it like that. And of course, um, Actually, uh, the last one, um, designed from the, uh, basically, reverse what you've been doing in the past. You're actually designing based upon where your most vital information is. And then you go outwards, and then you expand even further. And for many people, that is, it sounds very logical if you start doing it. But up front, usually, that's not where you start. I've been in IT since 1989. I started as a, uh, as a programmer at that time. You were like 12? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 13, no. <laughs> but still, it's, for, it's, it's very important. And as John rightfully said in the beginning, trust is not a binary thing. Trust is not IT. It's, uh, it's, it's something which we've been taught but it's something which works right here, but it doesn't work anywhere else. And actually in here, um, we also have to realize quite often that um, we are also flawed there. So you have to be really cautious in that part. So, and of course, everything is on a safe spot and that's where the idea is. And if you, if you look at the bell curve where you actually said the last part, uh, we actually made an error there, to be honest, uh, in our case. Uh, and that was kind of that we actually, we, uh, uh, we were a little bit over enthusiastic. So we were starting to inspect also the CCTV feeds in our entire environment. And that might sound like a good idea on paper, but if you're on a tight budget and you're running with the, uh, for uh, smaller sites, for the, uh, the, the smaller uh, PA200s at that time, you might get a performance issue. <laughs> so you have to really wonder whether or not you want to inspect all the CCTV feeds at that time. So eventually I made a budgetary decision, okay, we're not going to do that because it's not that valuable. So um, what did it bring us as within Daman? And we're very proud that this actually happened. Um, the crowd went nuts, but the reality is, uh, I wish, uh, it's still just a boring IT comp or boring IT within a shipbuilding company. Um, but it did bring us a whole lot of other things. It brought us a, an architecture which is fully suitable for the future, where we are protected. Are we 
the best in class? Oh, but not by far. I'm pretty certain that there's room to improve. It should be because everything is evolving. All the environments around us, all our companies which we cooperate with, everything is evolving. But at least we are. I get to actually reallocate my staff. I had a whole bunch of admins who were trying to manage the firewalls in the past ourselves. They can do stuff which they probably like even more because it wasn't their core competency and they really weren't that, you know, they actually were quite happy eventually thought, oh, that means I don't have to manage them. Oh, that's a managed service. Oh, that's a good idea. So you can imagine that how happy they were. So, um, so that, was, um, that was definitely uh, one of the, uh, the plus points for us. And of course, the very first one, the threats. Of course, uh, I'm going to knock on wood afterwards, but we haven't had a severe incident uh, uh, due to this. And I really hope that it also stays like that, of course, you can imagine. So my five closing tips. Um, first one is definitely start small. As John also, uh, also said, you have to start in uh, more like you have to, you have to pretty much you have to fiddle with it a bit. It. You have to fail. Fast failure, accept it. It's a good thing because then you learn. Because you only learn if you make a mistake. If you're doing it and it goes right, you're actually thinking in terms of a happy flow. And we all know that's going to bite you. That's definitely going to bite you. So, but then once you've got accustomed to it and you know what you're doing, back to the crown jewels. That's where the money is. That's where your risk is. And yes, there might be certain parts of your organization which doesn't apply as a crown jewel. Well, be realistic then. Focus on those. Focus on the crown jewels again. That's the most important one. And of course, uh, I'm not going to plug them again. I think we've done that quite a few times. But get help from anybody who is, who's done this before, who knows what they're doing, who can also challenge you. Because strange eyes can definitely help uh, in confrontation. And usually, yes, the confrontation actually uh, helps to improve. Um, and get your ducks in a row. In my case, oh, sorry, uh, the ducks was pretty much our IT staff. The rest was pretty much in a row as well. But your IT staff tends to be your biggest challenge in, to a certain extent, almost a tectonic change from what you were doing in the past. So, uh, and of course, last, did I mention the get help part? Uh, once more, get help in this one. So, uh, I said zero trust is a cybersecurity strategy, and here's how I'm going to prove it. This is a man named Jason Chaffis. He was the chairman of the Government and Oversight Committee of the United States House of Representatives. They wrote a data breach report after a big breach called Office of Personnel Management. It was huge in the US. It actually affected you, and we could talk about that offline at some point. But he actually wrote a, a byline article called Adopting a Zero Trust Cyber Model in Government. Now, he doesn't know anything about IT, but he understood the strategic power of zero trust. He said this, zero trust would have profoundly limited the attacker's ability to move within OPM's network and have access to such sensitive data. If you have a zero trust policy, uh, that limits the people's, uh, the user's ability or the packet's ability to, to do bad things. Uh, Brigham Young University did a pen test on their zero trust environment and the pen tester couldn't get in and he said, I need domain credentials. And the, CISO said, OK, I'll give you domain credentials. He had domain credentials, but because of the Kipling method policy, the domain credential didn't go anywhere. And the pen tester said to the CISO, what are you trying to do, make me look bad? And the CISO said, yes. Yes, I am. Right? Because it's all about policy. Right? You have to allow bad things to happen in your organization in order for bad things to happen. Every bad thing happens inside of an allow rule. Do you realize that? So if we can tighten down this policy and say resource Hans can talk to resource John over this particular application using these users, that's restrictive but usable. It's transparent to the people who are supposed to use those two resources, but it can't be manipulated by malicious actors because they don't have the policy that allows them to do bad things. Remember, all bad things happen inside the allow rule. And we've been given five extra minutes, by the way, back there. They didn't tell you that. But they asked us to start five minutes late and go five minutes over. So we have seven minutes, seven minutes for Q&A. So where's my mic runners? 
We're going to get some Q&A going. We're going to get you some energy here at 9 something in the morning. Who's got questions? Because this is the right time to ask them, and I know you have them. So ra raise your hand. We got one in the front here. I think, I think the mic is off. Mike, Mike. Uh, what color? Hello. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! Yep. So, uh, so thanks uh, for uh, both John and Hans. Uh, question to Hans. Yeah. Uh, so step two uh, is uh, all about mapping, right? Yeah. So mapping of the information and so on, which is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most challenging aspects because people will have system diagrams which are dated and so on. Yep. So how did you tackle that specific challenge? Uh, with a lot of pain and effort. <laughs> no, that's going to be the, uh, the honest answer. Uh, we, um, in the mapping phase, we actually also uh, had a very lengthy discussion with even our ERP vendor at that time, because we, uh, we came to the realization that even they were actually having outdated information. So this was definitely a pain. It's not going to be easy. Uh, I, can, I can sugarcoat it all you want, but that is definitely a painful and it's a lengthy process. And it's worthwhile doing it, uh, and you have to do it, but it's not going to be a Friday afternoon. So there's no, I, I didn't find a shortcut. If anybody knows it, please let me know so I can the use it again. The shortcut that I did when I was at Forrester was that I had my customer put uh, Pan OS devices in vWire mode so I could see everything that was yeah. going across. And yeah, I we said, did that as well. Yeah, That's true. and I said, oh, and then you can take them out later. That was my view at the yeah. time. And they never took them out. And that's how I kind of learned how to do this with Pen OS. But you get layer seven visibility is what's going to give you that transaction flow. And then couple that with Cortex, we can start to really do some of that stuff. Yeah. And then a lot of it is you have to go to the yeah. business owners and the application yeah. owners and do some interviews. And the reality is you don't need to be 100% right you just need to have a generalized view of how yeah. this works. And then that will show you where to put the controls. Yeah. I'm guessing nowadays, even with Cortex, it's much easier. When we were doing this, that wasn't even available. Uh, we, uh, we actually, we, 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 we licensed Cortex like a few weeks ago. We were using FRAPS before. So uh, I'm expecting that if we go to the next phase, uh, we get at least more or at least easier insight in actually doing this. So when we migrate. So yeah. Next question. Thank you. Who's got a question? Raise a hand so I can, right back. is that a question or are you bidding on a, no, no, okay, I thought he was, <laughs> so don't do that if, if this is a Careful, auction. because you actually just, I, might you you a, I might sell you a boat. So anybody else want to up him? I'm sorry. The one, no. one over there at the edge. Oh, there we have. Keeping Lee on in shape. He's an IT guy, he doesn't get no. much exercise. What do you think about uh, PAM, uh, Privilege Access Management Solution? to cut the admin rights and to give them uh, over a trusted application? So, uh, to be careful there, uh, yeah. I can do that in policy in user ID. So, there, you, you know, do you want, I mean, just like Nir talked about, you can have all these separate applications to do something that should be done in a system. And so think about that as you write policy. When you write a Kipling method policy, asked, do I need privilege access management? Or, I mean, a lot of that stuff happens because we had Telnet, right? Uh, or, or, or something like that, that, and we had Telnet talking to uh, a router that had a single admin password. So now we had to figure out who is actually making the change on the router, so then we created PAM to do that. Uh, but now we can say that John, the user ID John in this group has access to hopefully SSH, not Telnet, to do uh, router updates and log in to this, this particular thing. And so we can do it much differently today. So I would say a lot of these technologies are very last century technologies and uh, probably not the way we want to do them. But if you want to do it that way, uh, go for it, right? Uh, we can integrate with that. Other questions? No? No. Okay. No. Well, oh, whoa. Oh. In the right over here. Come on, Yuri. You can do it. <laughs> Yuri, Yuri, Yuri. How long do you keep the, the logs you are uh, doing from the traffic? And what are you doing with it? How long do you keep the traffic logs? I'm actually looking for our uh, whether or not they can address it for us. 
I'm a mic runner today. Yeah, you're a mic runner, but I think you can help us out as well here. You know the exact. I know what we roughly did. How long are they keeping their logs? I mean, typically, I think they're what? A year? Yeah, yeah uh, I think minimum, at least a minimum a year, if I'm correct. So it's yeah, everything, so. everything related to threats is, uh, is minimum a year. Yeah. And traffic is probably shorter, like three months or so. Yeah, I think it is something like that. It's so. usually dependent upon whatever compliance yeah. industry thing you have to meet. Yeah. So yeah, if you have to do PCI, that, yeah. you have to have three months available yeah. immediately. You have to keep it for a year, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's how long you should keep it. I mean, if, if it's more than a year and you need to do, go back and do a forensics investigation on a data breach, guess what? That data is long gone. True. The, the investigation is sort of meaningless at that point. So you can do it, but it's sort of meaningless. One more minute, one more question, anybody? Going once. Going twice. Sold the haunts. There we go. Yeah, Everybody, okay. thank, thank you. you very much. Enjoy the rest of your show. Thank you.